So the new kickoff rule changes have the Chiefs potentially doing some wild things that would have been unthinkable in years past. And in this video, I'll break down why that is. Look at a sneaky receiver who's been standing out at OTAs, several Chiefs coaches giving interesting thoughts and perspectives on the roster so far and more. But first, how about those? All right, first up, before we get into OTAs and everybody who spoke today, the Chiefs are scheduled to visit the White House tomorrow, Friday, May 31st. So stay tuned for that. Maybe check them out on TV if they happen to be in network. And maybe Travis Kelsey will actually take the mic and say something this time. Anyway, with that being said, today's practice, the media got a look and it looks like there was no Hollywood Brown, defensive tackle Isaiah Bugs, running back CEH, defensive tackle Chris Jones, wide receiver Kadarius Tony, left guard Joe Tooney, or cornerback Jalen Watson. All those guys were not in attendance, at least for today. However, Hollywood Brown was there earlier this week, as was Chris Jones. The Chiefs social media team dropped a video of Chris Jones working earlier this week, and Hollywood could be seen catching passes from the Chiefs OTA's photo gallery titled Day 5 of Phase 3 OTAs. That was this week. So, even though some of these players weren't there for the media look, they have been present in some capacity this week as well as last week. Now, I have no idea about defensive tackle Isaiah Bugs and if he's practiced at all with the team yet. And the reason I bring him up is because he's sadly another Chiefs player who has made his rounds in the news for not great reasons, allegedly not great at least. I spoke on this yesterday, and I'm going to get back to OTAs here in a second because there's a, another Chiefs player not in attendance who I would ideally have liked to see there. Wasn't there last week either, but first, it was reported yesterday Yesterday, that Bugs was facing two misdemeanor warrants on animal cruelty charges. Basically, two dogs were left on the back porch of a house he was renting in Tuscaloosa, Alabama for at least 10 days without any food or water. When animal control arrived, they were found hungry, dehydrated, and covered in feces. One of the two dogs, a pit bull, had to be euthanized due to being overly aggressive and, um, I think he failed his heartworm medication, while the other, a Rottweiler mix, is still in the care of the animal shelter. It's also worth noting that the house looked abandoned when animal control arrived, and although Bugs' lease was terminated on April 15th due to owing $3,100 in back rent, Bugs moved out of the house around March 19th, and per his agent, after this report dropped yesterday, Isaiah vehemently denies the truthfulness of the allegations and charges. He said the dogs did not belong to him, and he was unaware they remained at the property in question. Well, we got an update, a little bit of an update to the story today, and it looks like this morning, Bugs turned himself in to Tuscaloosa police. His total bond was set at $600. That's $300 for each dog. Another update goes on to say that Bugs is facing several other pending charges in municipal court. It looks like he's been arrested twice since April of this year, once for pushing the police chief Brent blankly into other officers, and another time, both of these allegedly, by the way, another time pointing a gun at a woman outside of his hook, hooker business. <laughs> oh, shoot. Not hooker business. Outside of his hookah business called King's <laughs> Hookah Lounge. Bugs mentioned those arrests via his agent statement yesterday, saying that no public record was made of those arrests, and he then accused the city of offering to drop those charges or not pursue those arrests in exchange for the voluntary surrender of his hookah, not hooker, business. Either way, it's all innocent until proven guilty, but yikes. This has been quite the offseason for the Chiefs, one player after another. Anyway, back to practice. I would love to see Kadarius Toney around at OTAs working and getting in sync with the team after a very underwhelming season last year, but for whatever reason, he is still not there. Your guess as to why is as good as mine, but at the end of the day, practice is still voluntary, so nobody is required to be there, even though some guys do get bonuses for attending these depending on how their contracts are structured. Offensive coordinator Matt Nagy, along with a bunch of other assistant coaches, spoke to the media today, and when Nagy was asked about expectations for Kadarius Tony this season, he replied that Tony understands the process mentally, but they want to see him make the simple plays be simple. His talent level is way up there, but they got to put him in positions to not overdo things, which I took to mean they don't want to see these mistakes from Tony on simple passes. Sure, he can juke any man out there out of their soul, but that doesn't really matter when he doesn't first secure the ball and gives up pick sixes and INTs. Now, 
There were some players in attendance today that did not practice, which means they are most likely nursing some sort of an injury. Andy Reid likes to be pretty safe with players during OTAs, so several of these guys could have very minor tweaks, nothing more, but those players there with helmets off, though they were at practice watching, were linebacker Leo Chanel, defensive tackle Derek Nottie, defensive end Charles Aminahue, we know that's his ACL, and wide receiver Xavier Worthy was once again not working as well due to tweaking his hamstring last week. I'm not worried about him at all, nor really any of these guys, because it's still so early in the offseason, though we know defensive end Charles Aminahue is going to take quite a while to recover from that torn ACL. From here, there's several players worth talking about from the eyes of their assistant coaches, starting with the offensive side of the ball. You're gonna wanna stick around as well and listen to what special teams coordinator Dave Tobe said about kickoffs because he said some stuff that will definitely raise your eyebrows in a good way, maybe. Matt Nagy noted that the left tackle spot is a moving process. Second round pick Kingsley Suomataia is learning the ropes at the moment. Meanwhile, Wanye is going into year two. The key is gonna be training camp when the pads come on and they can get a real look at the tackles and see how they respond with contact and all that good stuff. It's a competition at the end of the day for that left tackle spot. And offensive line coach Andy Heck basically echoed what Nagy said there. The main two fighting for the left tackle spot is Wanye Morris and Kingsley Suomataia, though that position is currently still wide open. He then mentioned that they feel good at the moment with their tackle depth. Uh, they got the international player, Jason Godrick. He's been improving heading into year two. Then they still have Lucas Niang around, who is a solid depth piece. On the right side of the line is, of course, the starter, Jawan Taylor, who definitely struggled a bit last year, leading the league in penalties after signing a pretty big deal with KC last offseason. Andy Heck didn't seem bothered by Jawan Taylor's performance last year, though, noting Jawan finished the season strong, and they expect him to pick things up right where he left off. He'll be much further along this season and noted sometimes it takes a player a year or two to adjust to a brand new system after spending multiple years in another. It also didn't help that the league intentionally targeted him after week one's matchup against the Lions, but hey, that's old news at this point, right? Anyway, another offensive lineman I've been very intrigued about due to ending the season on IR is left guard Joe Tooney. You don't have to report injuries at this point in the offseason, so very little is known about him right now. But Andy Heck, he was asked about Joe Tooney and his progress, and while he didn't comment on his recovery directly, basically said, I don't know exactly where he's at in his rehab with his pec. He did mention that Tooney is doing very well. He's in all the meetings, always around, and they're looking forward to getting him back even though they don't know when that is at this point in time. The tight end room is another position group to watch with four potential guys on early track to make the 53-man roster if they roll with four. And Irv Smith Jr., fourth round pick Jared Wiley. Noah Gray on a contract year, by the way, so he'll probably ball out. And of course, the freaking GOAT, Travis. Kelsey. Kelsey was seen out at practice today after not being there during the media look last week as he heads into year 13. Sheesh. Tom Melvin, the team's tight end coach, complimented the rookie Jared Wiley, noting he comes from a somewhat similar system, and even though they are throwing a lot at him, he's playing faster every day, and they are encouraged with where he's at right now at this point in the offseason. When asked about how the tight end room looks as a whole so far, uh, Tom Melvin basically said, until the pads come on, there's no way to truly tell. He actually said, quote, we have no clue. He's liking what he's seeing from these guys, though, but there's still a long ways to go. Next up is a sneaky receiver prospect to watch out for, and that is the second-year wideout, Nico Remigio. He sadly spent the entire season on IR after doing something to his shoulder during training camp that needed surgery, but he was standing out uh, at training camp before being injured and is once again standing out early on during OTAs as well. Both Harold Coons and Matt McMullen noted that he had a standout day today with Matt saying he had another strong day. Matt Nagy said he was proud of Nico last year, an undrafted guy that was a true professional in the meeting room and at practice until he unfortunately got injured. He's got to make an impact on special teams in order to most likely make the roster. At least that's what Nagy was saying. Uh, though he is rooting for him and thinks it would be a fun story for him to make this roster. So hey, maybe Remigio ends up being one of the returners, kickoffs, punts, 
doesn't really matter because I believe he can do both. So yeah, that's going to be where he has to shine, most likely, in order to catch on as maybe that wide receiver six spot. Then Matt Nagy was asked about the third running back spot. You have, of course, Pacheco and CEH, and then the third one is kind of wide open right now with McKinnon still being a free agent. And Nagy said they are looking for someone who can do a bit of everything, run the ball, catch the ball out of the backfield, and know where they need to be in terms of pass protection. Quote, there's going to be a great healthy competition, but you won't truly see that until training camp. Basically, you won't know anything for any position group until training camp, but hey, here we are. I did find it interesting, though, that a running back on the roster has been getting the starting returner reps as a kick returner early on so far, and that is the Welshman, Louis Reese Zamet. Special teams coordinator Dave Tobe said that LRZ has been getting starting reps to get as many of those reps under his belt as possible, considering he has never played football before and has a lot to learn and catch up on. So some took that as hey, LRZ is probably going to be the starting returner. I took that as Tobe is doing him a favor, giving him as many reps as humanly possible before the pads come on because he just hasn't played football before. Meanwhile, some of his teammates have been playing since the fourth grade. Tobe also spoke pretty in depth about the new kickoff rule changes and how that's changed a huge aspect about how they see things as far as kickoffs are concerned. He actually mentioned that Harrison Butker may not be the primary kicker this season, and I'll get into why that is here in a moment, but Tobe said every day they are working on kickoffs or kick returns alternating every other day. The goal is to get the ball on the ground away from the returner as quickly as possible because as soon as the ball hits the ground in the landing zone or the target zone, teams can move, which is actually a big difference from the XFL. In the XFL, teams couldn't move until the ball was actually caught. Well, in the NFL, teams can move as soon as the ball touches the ground, so that's something they've been working on from the jump. In the XFL under those rules, Tobe then noted that kickers were involved in 25 to 40% of tackles in one way, shape, or form, and that's why they don't really want Harrison Butker involved. They want someone that can make a tackle more routinely. He did say Butker can do it in a pinch, but they don't want him making tackles all season long. I mean, just think about this, worst case scenario here, but Butker is so valuable for field goals. He was clutch last year, basically the team's MVP, winning several of the games just on these field goals alone. But just imagine Butker gets injured trying to make a tackle on the kickoff. That is freaking absurd. Please know. Now, Tobe did say touchbacks are something that Harrison Butker could be brought out there for and used on because there's going to be times in games when they'd rather a team get the ball at the 30 yard line rather than chance giving up a huge return. However, Tobe did not seem like he loved the idea of Butker being the team's primary kicker this season. Sure, he can do it and will be used at times when the ball is needed to be placed in a very specific spot, but he noted a couple of others that could be used instead. Of course, there is safety Justin Reed. He can kick, has great field vision, and then can go down and make that tackle. I mean, his job is being the team's safety net on defense, tackling, lighting people up. You know, you know how it goes. So I'm pretty sure he would be confident to do the same thing, be the safety net on special teams as well. Tobe mentioned that having someone like Justin Reed out there would make opponents legitimately have to worry about blocking Justin. Meanwhile, if you had somebody like Butker out there, teams could actually leave him unblocked to focus their efforts elsewhere. Justin Reed, though, is a completely different beast. The next player Tobe mentioned actually made my eyebrows raise a little bit here. He mentioned that Louis Reese Zamet is every bit as good as Justin Reed on kickoffs due to his rugby background. He can also kick field goals and, of course, is working on being able to return kickoffs as well. But man, how wild would it be to see LRZ out there kicking kickoffs, being the one kicking the ball, not just returning it? I mean, I still think I would rather have Justin Reed out there over anyone else. But that is still intriguing to think about, to say the least. Not to mention the fact that if LRZ makes the roster, the team has yet another backup kicker outside of Justin Reed if Butker goes down. Tobe also mentioned how much things are going to change with these new kickoffs rules. He brought some specifics in here. Last year, there were 1,970 touchbacks, but this year, they think there's going to be 1,600 less touchbacks with this rule change. There's still a lot to figure out, and tactics they have in place before the start of the season could end up getting thrown out the window once they actually get an opportunity to test it, but it's definitely an exciting time for special teams, that's for sure. Something else that'll be somewhat exciting to watch is something you don't really wanna care to watch often, I guess, but 
This is due to the fact that there is a legitimate punter battle going on this season with Tommy Townsend now at the Titans. Tobe said the battle between Matt Ariza, who they signed earlier this offseason, and Ryan Rico, arguably the best punter from this draft class that went undrafted, is real close right now. They are both excellent punters, but they are testing everything from punts to how they throw the ball for fakes as well as placeholding for Harrison Butker. And Tobe said he's going to get with Butker eventually to see who he's preferring as a placeholder, and that could possibly be the make it or break it aspect for this punter battle. Another battle to watch out for is the cornerback room with Legeria Sneed now a Titan. Defensive backs coach Dave Merritt said that Sneed is hard to replace. In fact, he said, it's like replacing Michael Jordan. Um, he then clarified, I'm not saying Sneed is the GOAT or anything, but the type of skill set Sneed has was his skill set alone. Defensive coordinator Steve Spagnolo said nobody in particular is gonna directly replace Legereus Sneed. They've got a long way to go to see who will eventually replace him, but it's not going to be one person in particular. Well, at least he didn't make it seem like it, it necessarily would be. He said this, quote, whether we do it with one person, two people, shift guys around, we've got a long way to go. McDuffie could be moved outside rather than playing in the slot like he did last year. You've also got Nazi Johnson and Jalen Watson to be considered in the mix, and they aren't even out there yet. Dave Merritt said that McDuffie was a first-team All-Pro last year. He's his own player and will do well with whatever role he plays this season. Another player who's going to do well in his role is defensive back Chamari Connor. He's light years ahead of where he was last year, though he's still spinning a bit as they load him down with much more of a workload. Quote, he's getting there, said Coach Spags. I mean, shoot, I'm personally a big fan of Connor. As last year when he was a rookie, he played five different positions in the secondary, which is something defensive backs coach Dave Merritt can't recall ever happening with any other rookie he's ever coached. Spags noted Connor's been playing in the slot role a bit here with Nick Jones doing so as well. Trent McDuffie, of course, could always slide back inside if needs be, but if you listen to my interview with Nazi Johnson earlier this week, they very well could be trying to move McDuffie outside, though time will surely tell. Another intriguing safety is the fourth round pick, Jaden Hicks, who's been flooded with info so far due to them having him playing all over the field. Spag certainly likes him. He made a standout play today, and in the end, he thinks Jaden is, quote, gonna be okay out there in the secondary. He's certainly a guy I'm excited about, as he was arguably the steal of the draft for the Chiefs. His rookie year, may involve a lot of special teams with very little defensive play unless injuries hit, but the future is bright, in my opinion, for Jaden Hicks. Then there's the sixth round pick, cornerback Kamal Haddon. Uh, Spags noted he's not afraid to be loud from the jump. He likes that about him as it shows you have some confidence, which can only help. He doesn't yet know everything and is still making mistakes, but quote, We'll see where he is in terms of talent and if he's good enough to play at this level come training camp. Someone that I truly hope stands out in training camp or very early on this season is the team's former first round pick of 2023, defensive end Felix and UDK Uzama. Spags noted that FAU has done a nice job and is a definite riser. He's more comfortable out there on the field this go round, having a year under his belt. And he also had a much slower start last off season due to various injuries that caused him to not even be available to practice until training camp. He's healthy now, and these extra months are gonna be good for him heading into year two. And with Charles Aminahue continuing to rehab that repaired ACL, FAU is gonna be needed from the start of this season. Someone I'm glad is gonna be here this season at all is defensive backs coach Dave Merritt himself. He actually took an interview in the offseason with the 49ers for the defensive coordinator position. Many of you might remember that. Um, but he said this, what he learned from that experience was, you've got to stay ready because you will never know when an opportunity like that comes up. At the end of the day, though, while most of his kids are now out of the house, he still has a 16-year-old daughter that he's trying to raise and to lead. He wants to be there for her and around for her during the last couple years of high school and as a father of two girls myself, I found that pretty commendable of merit, even though I know his time to climb the ranks will come sooner rather than later. With all that being said, let me know your thoughts on using Justin Reed or LRZ on kickoffs rather than Harrison Butker and who you would prefer out there. Then let me know your thoughts on Lewis Reese Zamet getting the starting kick returner reps. Do you think it's simply just to give him as many reps as humanly possible before the pads come on? Or do you think there's a bit more to it? Let me know either way in the comments down below. And until next time, let's go. Let's freaking go. How about those?